Thank you, Francesco. And first, congratulations for this initiative. I think that the Greater Bay Area is a new world, and uh, we we are start together a group of people that have produced uh, research and knowledge and projects about this area. So I'm very happy to be part of this panel, and I think that this initiative that you are that you are uh, hosting it's an important initiative to federate all of this interest about the Greater Bay. Okay, with no further ado, let's uh, introduce our first speaker of session three. Uh, so our first speaker will be Matthew Carmona. Matthew Carmona is professor of planning and urban design at the Bartlett UCL. He's an architect and planner with research interests in the fields of urban design governance, the design and management of public space, and the value of urban design. He, he chairs the uh, Place Alliance and edits placevaluewiki.net. His research can be found at his own website, matthewcarmona.com. So please, uh, Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nuno. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, and uh, that one. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the publicization of private space. And the thorny, the thorny question of public space and who owns and manages, uh, manages it has uh, long been debated, of course, with, with great passion around the world. And I'm going to talk today about uh, a, a recent piece of uh, research that I, I well, a piece of research that I've recently published, uh, which looks uh, at London, but I think um, uh, the, the, the issues that it addresses are, are very relevant to the Greater Bay Area. I know Francesco's uh, work in particular uh, has focused on, on these aspects. Um, and um, so I hope it will have resonance to, to, to the wider discussions that you've been having. Um, now, unfortunately, as, as an area of research, this this area I think is is more characterized by misinformation and dogma than, than necessarily by by clarity and, and pragmatism and certainly recently uh, in London there's been much hyperbole about the so-called privatization of public spaces and crudely this can be represented as a sort of tussle between two contrasting quite polemical positions um, so in the UK, the, the debate has been spearheaded by the Guardian newspaper uh, in a series of pieces that has fo have focused uh, primarily on London and have attempted to map and um, sort of denounce uh, the privately owned and managed spaces that, that feature at the heart of many regeneration projects across the city. Uh, their recent headline read that uh, these squares are our squares. Be angry about the privatization of, of public space. This strand of opinion, broadly speaking, argues that uh, London is increasingly reliant on a, on a large, powerful uh, uh, group of developers to create its public realm. Uh, they are effectively privatizing large parts of the city by retaining ownership and management responsibilities for streets and spaces. And they do so that at the expense of citizens' rights, some of whom uh, are excluded whilst other activities are restricted. Now, more rarely voiced, uh, but articulated very often privately by certain development interests is, is a counter set of arguments that claims that privatization of public space brings distinct benefits. Now, the most vociferous advocate of this has been Patrick Schumacher of Zaha Hadid's architect, who has gone so far as to claim that uh, privatization uh, is always good and should always be encouraged uh, because it brings sort of entrepreneurial energy to the management of spaces. Now, these arguments broadly go that uh, the public sector struggles to devote adequate resources to the creation, let alone the management of public spaces. So developers and investors have a legitimate interest in helping to fill that gap. And in doing so, they're protecting their own investments and, and save money for taxpayers by taking on the costs of managing spaces. Of course, 
it's not so simple as either of these rather polemical positions would suggest. And I, and I think a third more nuanced and, and evidence-based view argues that the situation is certainly uh, more complex. In reality, uh, the term privatization of public space is itself hugely confusing because it assumes that once publicly owned and managed spaces are somehow becoming private uh, in a sort of new wave of enclosures, echoing the enclosures that we saw in England in, from the 16th century onwards from in, in our rural areas, but this time urban. To the extent that, that uh, to, to, well, to, the exa to examine the extent of this, um, I decided to look at the 54 spaces that the Guardian had identified as being privatised public space. And to do that, uh, I used initially uh, contemporary plans, which I overlaid with uh, onto historic plans of these parts of London that uh, had these various projects. And what the analysis revealed is that real privatisation actually is very, very rare indeed. It almost never happens in London. Instead, what we've seen in London over certainly the last three decades is an opening up through redevelopment of formerly private, walled and gated off areas to public use through large scale redevelopment schemes usually of former docks, industrial areas, bits of redundant infrastructure and so forth. So if you interrogate, and I did interrogate the Guardian data, what it reveals is that, that in fact that 84% of those spaces that, that, that they looked at uh, were in fact uh, formerly private spaces, entirely private spaces that had become public. And the remaining 16% were historically privately owned and managed spaces, uh, but with public access. So bringing space properly into public use, even if it remains in private ownership, is arguably a significant public gain. Um, so we might call it the publicization of private space rather than the other way around. And a classic example of that would be somewhere like King's Cross uh, in London, which um, is one of the case studies uh, that the, the Guardian picked. Now, this was a former railway lands, entirely private, not with no access to, to, to the public, um, which has been created into a new uh, uh, quarter uh, in London. Entirely uh, owned and managed by a private corporation, um, but giving much back to society, I think most people would, would recognise in, in a new series of public spaces, all sorts of activities uh, going on throughout the week, throughout the year, um, at least when COVID's not stopping them, um, all maintained uh, at uh, largely private expense. Um, and as I say, uh, lots of you know, bags of character and um, an interesting uh, sequence of events and activities. Now, of course, cities have always been full of privately owned but publicly accessible space. Uh, this is a sign which happens to appear on, on, on the side of one of our Bartlett buildings. Uh, most people don't notice it as they, as they walk past the street, but it, effectively it says that half of the street, as you walk down it, is actually owned and, and managed by UCL. Um, and it's preserving those rights. And most people don't notice that, and they just walk on the private and the public bits together. And cities are like that. They, they contain lots of private space as well as uh, public space. Now, I would argue that morally and pragmatically, it matters little who actually owns and manages public spaces. Um, there can, there can even, as some argue, be cost savings to the public sector through not taking on the responsibility of management. But, and it's a big but, what matters is how public spaces are. In other words, what are our rights as citizens within spaces and what are the responsibilities to us of those who own and manage those spaces? So if we look at this issue from an alternative viewpoint, many publicly owned and managed spaces are often themselves highly restrictive. Um, this is a notice in one uh, outside one um, uh, Victorian city hall 
uh, which lists 32 bylaws with all sorts of restrictions, including some very strange ones, like you're not allowed to use metal detectors or fly model aircraft or collect bird's eggs. Also some more worrying ones, uh, you're not allowed political demonstrations, you're not allowed to collect money, you're not allowed uh, to uh, beg in and, and performance. Now this is an entirely publicly owned and managed space. If we look at Trafalgar Square, it has an even longer list, including restrictions on taking photographs without written prior permission for the purposes of, uh, of or connection with a business, trade, profession or employment. So I took this uh, picture uh, as a part of a piece of research I was doing a few years ago in connection with my employment as an academic. So, strictly speaking, the picture is illegal. Now in London, of course, like many cities, um, what you see is that some of the most active and, and animated places like the, the, the path along the Thames is in fact a hodgepodge of public and private ownerships. And you walk from one to the other without almost knowing uh, that you're passing uh, through various ownerships. And we can find similar situations across the UK and, and across the world and a diverse range of essentially private organisations that own many spaces, uh, including various institutions like universities, churches, corporations, charities, um, and of course, the vast majority still owned and managed by the public sector. All have an important role to play in the sum total of urban life. The same goes for privately owned and managed, but publicly accessible spaces. And some have needless petty restrictions over matters such as taking photographs. This was me being told off in a privately owned public space uh, in London, being told off for taking a photograph. What detracts is uh, when spaces that should be open and unrestricted for various reasons are not, whether they're private uh, or public. And so whether spaces are public or private owned or managed, we should oppose needless and petty restrictions on use of public spaces, unless there are very good reasons for those restrictions to be in place. And this can be done, I've argued, care of a, of a simple charter of public space rights and responsibilities. So the planning process is typically where private aspirations and public interests are ultimately reconciled. Um, or perhaps not. And it's therefore the key point at which we need to take into account the uh, publicness and the future publicness of any spaces that are being created, no matter who uh, owns and manages them. Because once permission is given, it's very difficult to change those, uh, um, those relationships uh, afterwards. So such a charter would therefore uh, apply at the point that planning permission is being granted uh, for any development, no matter what type of development. So it would apply to, all, apply to all spaces, both existing and those still to be built, that a reasonable person would regard as public, whether privately or publicly owned. And this would cover all spaces that during daylight hours are usually open and free to enter. Now, quite a few years ago now, I published a, a sort of straw man charter, pub, uh, uh, charter of public rights and responsibilities as a way of encouraging debate. Um, uh, this was it, it was sh pretty short. More important than the text itself was the sort of principles underpinning it. And these were that with, with rights come responsibilities for both the users of public space and for those who manage and maintain them that principles should, regard, should, should apply regardless of who ultimately owns uh, and manages that space, that it's about safeguarding freedoms, not restricting behaviours, and that's an important differentiation in the way that we think about space. We should keep it simple, we shouldn't try and control more than necessary, and we should keep it absolutely clear. And recently, in the last few years, the Mayor of London picked up on this idea and included the commitment for a new public London charter in the London plan. And that was very recently published, this new public London charter. Um, and it includes eight generic principles, which 
have the status of guidance as a sort of benchmark for owners to voluntarily sign up to. Now, whether that voluntary, voluntary nature of this charter will be enough, we have yet to see. Putting the principles into practice myself, I've recently been involved with five uh, developers uh, and in fact the US Embassy as well, uh, looking at the Nine Elms area of uh, South London, which has got a large new linear park running through it, all entirely uh, uh, owned and managed by those different organisations. And I've been working with the local authority and all of those organisations to produce a, uh, a charter. And this charter will be, uh, well, that's the charter, you obviously can't read it, um, but it will be guaranteed through a, an agreement with the, between the developer and the, and the public authority. Um, it will be enacted through the management company on which the London Borough of Wandsworth, the local authority, is represented uh, and will be publicly visible to all users. And importantly, um, the charter is written in positive language throughout. So it's not about restricting behaviours, it's about encouraging behaviours uh, with clear responsibilities, responsibilities set out for all parties and clear instructions for what to do if proposals fall outside of the norms. So to conclude, cities are diverse places. Diversity is in their nature, it's part of their essence and, and we should not restrict them and uh, their public spaces into a sort of one-size-fits-all design and management approach simply for narrow political or dogmatic reasons. At the same time, we do not need to safeguard um, the rights and responsibilities uh, of all. Sorry, we, we do need to safeguard the rights and responsibilities of all. Um, and it's important that the public sector takes the leading role in that, in safeguarding the publicness of all spaces across our cities, wherever they happen to be, and regardless of ultimate ownership and management. Unfortunately, uh, this is a responsibility uh, which is often not taken nearly seriously enough. So if you're interested in the discussion and the arguments I've made and you're interested in reading the various charters that I've briefly flashed up, then you can look at this paper which was recently published, The Publicization of, of Private Space in the Journal of Urbanism. Um, and uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. So it's... Uh... Thank you for your presentation that that makes us look into something that everyone takes for granted in a different take and i think that in the greater bay this publicization of uh, of private space is is a key topic is in macau is in hong kong with different models but i think that this is very very suitable for our discussion here thank you so the 